Hello, I'm Karen McKinney, um, Biblical Theological Studies Department and specializing in youth ministry. It's a way of doing education where as much as you can do, the learning is by doing and it's hands-on. So it assumes that that learners should be active, not passive in the learning, um, that motivation is internal, so it requires inquiry, um, so that they want, they, they want to do the learning. It assumes that students bring something, that, that teachers aren't the only ones who know, that students also know, and that they have something to offer. And that reflection is a critical piece of learning. So experiential education requires that, um, that students reflect or debrief after the experience. Because it requires that they be active and they be hands-on, that they do something, that draws them in. Um, see, they're not allowed to just sit passively for the most part. They, they have to do something, and in the doing of that, then even if they are not a, a, a student who talks much, they did something, and so they, there's something that, you know, if a question is asked directly of them, then they can respond because they, they were active in whatever, whatever we did. And so they would have something to say, even if they don't want to volunteer it, they could still, it could still be drawn out. I, I have goals that I'm trying to, that I'm shooting for. So I have, I know what I want um, them to learn from the learning, but that doesn't mean that that's all they're going to learn. So in the reflection piece, um, generally I have students sit in a circle um, at the same level because sometimes what we did required a whole lot of different things and, and oftentimes emotions come in. And so having them sit in a circle where everyone can see each other and everyone can participate and, and I, um, preface it by saying, I want to hear all your voices. That's why you're sitting in a circle. And I ask questions. The first couple of questions might require that everybody respond. Um, and then um, we go to um, kind of a debriefing of, well, what happened? Um, I use a what, a so what, a now what kind of reflection. That's the basic one. Um, and then I do some other things from there. But I set it up so that um, we can review and recall what happened. Um, and then we can try to make, help them make meaning out of what happened and, and really taking a look at it and, and saying, you know, how does it relate to what, we're, what, what are the themes of the class and, and all of that. I think that the traditional educational approach um, is set up for logical, um, mathematical, um, verbal linguistic type learning. And I think there's lots of other ways of learning, lots of other kinds of intelligences. And so I think that people learn best by doing. Um, and that you have to involve the whole person. That when you engage all of their senses, they learn more and they retain more. And so um, to make an appeal to broader intelligences and all kinds of learning, um, that's why I, I do it. And I also think that they retain better when they are active in the learning. I, you know, I can teach, I can go in and lecture on Amos, and they'll forget that lecture. Some of them will forget it, you know, the minute they walk out of the classroom. But if I do something active, if I take the first five students who show up and make them lay down on the floor, and I lay down on the floor with them, and for those students to enter that class, they have to figure out how to get over us. They might have to walk on us or crawl on us, and I don't let them jump because that would be dangerous. But they have to figure out, how are they going to get in this classroom? And now they're stuck with this dilemma. And I say, hurry up, hurry up, you got two minutes to get in here. And they're trying to get in. And, and you know, they're like, what do we do, what do we do? And then they finally, you know, somebody crawls and so, okay, let's crawl, let's roll, let's, let's get in here. And I tell the ones that laid down, I said, you know, if it hurts, you know, groan and grunt. And, and, and so I'm down there with them and, and then they have to get over six people to get in the classroom. And then, you know, I say, okay, I'm gonna shut the door in 30 seconds. And you know, there's six or seven of them that, no, I'm not gonna crawl over somebody, I'm not gonna do this. And I'm like, okay, door shut, you don't get to come to class. And they're like, what? And, and then I, you know, shut the door and they're standing there and then I open it back up and I say, okay, you guys can come in. But for a moment, they were like thinking, we're not going to get into class. And then, you know, I, we go and we debrief that and we talk about what's a dilemma and what does it mean to walk on the oppressed, which are the words of Amos. 
And, and so if we talk about that, and who are the oppressed now? And, and you know, I had more women than anything laying down there. And when, you know, what was going on in, in Amos's day? You know, and then that's my preface for leading into talking about Amos. They're going to remember the day that they had to crawl on their teacher and their classmates to get into class, more so than they're going to remember some lecture I gave on Amos. Um, and hopefully they'll make the connections. It doesn't work when you have a body of knowledge that you, the teacher, know and the students don't know. Um, so then you might have to lecture. But almost anything else, when you want to disequilibrate students, when they come with some knowledge of something, um, but not all of it, and you know that they bring, they bring different levels to the classroom, when you have some concepts that students don't seem to be quite getting, and you can take those concepts and actualize them in a way that will help them get it, um, when you can take something that seems to be kind of abstract and you can make it visual so visual learners can get it and you know those kinds of when you have those kinds of goals and objectives then um, experiential education will work okay what you're about to see is a simulation exercise called other people's power and this class is um, Reconciliation in a Racialized Society. And we're using this simulation because the majority of the students tend to be white, and, and so they give intellectual assent to understanding something, but they haven't experienced it. So this exercise will exaggerate some experience and will give some in the class an, an opportunity to have an experience they've never experienced before and that will help them be in touch with the realities that we're talking about. And it will also build empathy, we hope. You don't have to agree to trade blind if you don't want to. That's all up to you. It's your trading, okay? Mm -hmm. Now, if you like what you have and you don't want to trade, you'll still have to leave the area, your home area, but you can just walk around with your hands like this. This means you can watch things. You're not gonna talk to anybody. Saying, don't come up to me, don't talk to me, I don't want to trade with you, leave me alone. All right? If you don't want to stand like this, put your hands in both pockets. This is the same indication. Leave me alone, I'm just walking around, don't talk to me, I don't want to trade with you. All right? Any questions? Everybody understand? All right, come on this way. Now, when you get in the room, what I want you to do is take your coat and all your junk and just set it down up against the wall, okay? There'll be a place up against the wall where you can set all your stuff. Take off your coat, you're, you're, in, you're in classroom. All right, come on. of the same color, you get the value of the chips plus 10 points. So what I need you to do right now is add up the value of your chips, and if you have any of these combinations, get yourself your bonus, and tell your scorekeeper your score so we know where you start from. You need a, you need a stand, uh, you got 60? How many do you have? 50. Is it 50 or 60? 50. 50? 50. Yeah. Sari? 40. 50. 50. Look, can you guys count? Like, is it 40, 50, which is it? 50. 50. 
She has 50. Christy, there's Christy. 80. You have 80. Yeah. 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 You guys have your scores up? This is Debbie. How many you have? You guys got your scores up? Everybody, everybody else over there is ready. There's no trading in the home area. You can trade anywhere else in the room, but just not in the home area. So I need everyone to stand up, leave the home area. Remember, you can trade with anybody. Go and make deals. Go do it. Yes. Get your scores up. Go make deals. You stay here one minute, okay? He's going to time you, and if you're fine, then if you don't look around, then you're done. If you do look around, then you have to do another minute. You understand? Nod or say yes. Okay, you stay there. Stay close. Okay, no training in the home all right, get 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 um get your scorekeeper your new score. Yeah, okay. Oh, Adam. Yeah, I'm 65. And We have Princess Holda. Is that you? That's me. Okay, Princess Holda started at 95 and went up to 110. Let's give her a round of applause. Madam Mary Ellen, Madam Mary Ellen here. Madam Mary Ellen started at 100. She stayed at 100. That's still a very good score. <laughs> Princess Kate, where's Princess Kate? Princess Kate started at 115, went up to 130. Leela started at 65, went up to 70. That's a decent score. That's a good little game that you want to keep working at. It. Sophia, where's Sophia? Sophia started at 95, went up to 120. Very good, Sophia. Tiffany, where's Tiffany? Tiffany started at 60, went up to 70. All right, that's the way to go. Everybody's doing the right direction. <laughs> Did you guys check that? Because you know people like him. Yeah. Did you check? Okay. There, there's some yeah, different counters good. in here, I tell you that. Okay. Um, she, Especially Trish. that one over there. Trish? <laughs> Why do you guys get regular names like regular Americans? What is with this? Where you at? Okay, you started at 50 and you went up to 95. All right, good for you. Um, Siri, where's Siri? Siri, you started at 50 and you went up to 65. Okay. 55. Oh, 55. She tried to tell me she had 80. I know, you know people like this life. What can you expect with people like that? You get two cards to make suggestions that you would like to add as new rules to the game. All right, you guys? Just write on the card, one rule per card, suggestions that you would like to have. Is who would like to write? Or you have one of your children to write for you. I'll write. Oh, okay. <laughs> All right, who's going to write here? Okay. Suggestion, okay. You, you can borrow a pen from her if you don't have one. Okay. And you guys, look at me, look at me, look at me. Good, okay. You get to write one rule for this card and one rule for this card. You understand? Okay, who's going to write? Who's going to write? Can you write English? Okay, okay, there you go. Okay, just make sure you get it back because you know people like with ears like that steel. Man, uh, one chip as a donation to be given to them. All right, the second rule, listen up. The second rule that they would like to suggest is that if you trade with the gold, one of their chips, you have to give them two. So um, one chip for two of theirs. All right, so that's their suggestions. Very good suggestions. Yes, they are. From this group, all right, opposite values, blue equal gold and white equal green. <laughs> These people Is are that dumb? I know. Yeah. I don't get it. Oh, we don't either. Yeah. White equal green? She was white writing with white. a green pen and she thought everything yeah. should have been that way. I don't know. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> Need to trade if you're asked. Well, of course you trade if you're asked. They're, it's slow learners. I know. I, it's just like, you guys just don't get it. Okay. But it was a good idea. It was a good idea. But we're not going to do this. All right. Here's what we're going to do. That's okay. you. All right. Get those scores out. All right. Cut. Get in. Get in and make it tough for everybody. All right. Now, before we do the next thing, we need to get your scores. Shut up! Well, is that's that's your ass. 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 Talk. Everybody know what they are. We need to look over here. Everybody know what they are. All right. So we're going with no smiling. Ten. Ten. Yes. Yes, sir. 
You can't come in here and look over here. I just don't understand. Steffi, knees down, nose against the wall. This is about the fifth person from this group that don't get it. You can divide it up however you like. You can give it all to one person if you want. Now, if you divide it up, it has to be divided in multiples of five. Okay? So if you divide it up, it has to be by multiples of five. You guys understand? Mm -hmm. So make your decision and then have your scorekeeper write it down. Make your decision, have your scorekeeper write it down. You guys, look at me, look at me. Okay, if you divide it up, it has to be like 5, 10, 15, 20. Do you understand? <laughs> look at me, do you understand? Okay, so go ahead and decide how you want to do your 100 points. Uh, the gold, the gold star people um, have requested them. And so now that... that you were to be quiet. Backs up are on the wall. Megan, do you understand? Mm -hmm. Okay, I need those chips. So, because those are resources that the other group would like. Thank you. So I think we should sing a song, a happy song. What do you think about that? No? They gave five of their people 20 points. This group decided to divide it up amongst themselves, and they gave 15 to one, five to the other, and the remaining 15 they gave to this group over here. This group right here um, divided it up amongst the lowest scored people, and the one person that's still, Bravna, who's still in there, was given 15 that they gave. Yeah, no, I don't have a sticker, so then I guess that I'm not included in the game. So. If you put it over to the side, be careful with it. it it's nuclear. If it, if it, if it, if it, if it, no, 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 you can't put it that far. Okay. If something happens and, 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 and if you guys don't treat it kindly, it might erupt, and you know who will get it if, if, if it erupts. Okay, so you need to be careful about that nuclear power plant that's on your reservation. To talk about what happened in this exercise that we just did, so we're going to process it. And, and, and we're going to debrief and kind of deconstruct, and we're going to see if we can see parallels to the real world. Remember, this is a class on racism, so we're looking at, we're looking at it from that perspective, but we'll, there'll be other things to see too. So I'm going to ask everybody to participate in the discussion. That means I'm asking everyone to contribute. So the first, um, so, so one person, yeah, um, I'm going to ask everybody this first question, and I want everyone to respond. My first question is, what feelings came up for you? What did you feel? We're going to talk about what you thought later, but I want to start with what did you feel? What feelings? And I'm going to ask that you really listen to each other. When you have your feelings, stick your thumb up. That means that you're ready. And we're going to, we're going to, we're going to get this response from everyone. All right, I see some thumbs. And you're allowed to have more than one feeling. And if somebody says what you were thinking, you can, you can repeat it. If, if you had that same feeling, just go ahead and say that feeling. Um, I felt like it was weird. Can you give me some more? I, weird in the sense like I shouldn't be in that position, but I was sometimes okay with it. Okay, so what are feeling words? Well, I guess like awkward though. I felt really restrained, and I didn't like that at all. So then I got like motivated and a little bit angry, and I was trying to figure out some way to get people to stop listening to everyone. <laughs> Powerful and content. I felt a little bit anxious. Um, And I felt a little bit happy. Frustrated. I felt silence. Um, I felt angry, frustrated, disgusted. Um, I 
Um, scared, frustrated, relieved, mad, ashamed. Wait, wait, wait. Could you going way too fast? Yeah. <laughs> scared, 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 frustrated, frustrated, relieved, relieved, mad, mad, and ashamed. And ashamed. I felt indifferent and remorseful. Sad. Um, I felt conflicted between being empowered and feeling guilty. I felt abandoned, pathetic, and helpless. <laughs> and they're, they're the ones that are empowered. I actually kind of also felt close just because it's kind of a group consensus, and I was just, like when we made the rules, I, I didn't go and demand any donation or anything like that, because I felt guilty, and at the end I just wanted to give my chips all away. Just because I, and then when we sent the other group out, I, was, I didn't say anything, the entire group kind of, yeah, and so I was just like, I didn't really Everybody else in the group made the decision. Yeah, right. and so even though I was in the Empower group, I felt almost powerless to do anything, because, yeah. <coughs> So, so. so you just went along, but you didn't, you didn't say anything. Well, because, just... yeah, it was hard. I, it was also awkward. I'd never done this before, so I didn't really know what to do. With anything, but... So it was that group that, by the way, it was that group that decided to kick this group out. They made the decision to, to kick them out. Go ahead. I don't understand your feeling of powerlessness. I, I know you just said it and you explained it. Yeah, I don't understand that. Um, I just didn't. Because I'm more reserved, I just didn't, and I was, it was a new game. I would felt a little bit awkward, or like I wasn't quite as confident in speaking up and saying, No, I don't want to do that. But I also didn't, I didn't want to send the other group out, or I didn't want to necessarily make those rules to, because I, I like fairness and I'm also competitive, but I like being competitive and fair. So, how did you vote? I didn't, I didn't say anything, I didn't say yes, I, I just didn't know how to change the course. Did because you, did I, you vote? I, didn't, I didn't say yes, I didn't agree. She didn't say no either. Yeah, so did you vote no? They didn't ask for no's. So I didn't know what to do. So you, your first venture out, if you were from this group, <coughs> did you feel fairly good about yourselves and you would yeah, I go think out like and... We were talking about before, we didn't know that they were given a gold and a green chip and we didn't know how, I mean, you could probably assume that we were given lower chips, but you didn't really know, so you went around the first time and kind of figured out, oh, they all have way higher chips than us, and maybe some people still have lower chips they wanted to trade, but by the end, they obviously all had, like, green and gold, and they weren't going to trade. Had they welcomed you when you first mm -hmm. went out? Do you think you would eventually feel resentful? You mean, like, later on? I yeah. Had, yeah. Had, they, had, they, had they welcomed you into sort of the larger society? Had they, had they welcomed you? Here, have some chips, have some juice, have some, come be with us. Yeah. Would you resent them? No, probably not. I mean, I don't know. I mean... So what I'm trying to get is like, I wonder, does the resent come in response <laughs> to contact? Or is the resent there in the beginning? Is it, is it a responding feeling? Or is it a, I have it to begin with? Probably a little bit to begin with. I mean, right away when you walk in the room and you see I'm standing in this box and I kind of want to sit in that blue chair over there, I mean, that stuff, I think, comes with it. But then it gets stronger. And I think that you kind of, like, subconsciously, like, each group started fitting into their own group. Like, they, like they didn't realize what we were going through or think they were trying to win the game because that was the goal. And for us, it wasn't so much we didn't think we were ever going to win. So it wasn't like we were trying to win the game anymore. Just maybe trying to like not kneel by the wall or I don't yeah, know, I get pushed to... in the square. He like grabbed my hat off my head and started dragging me by my shirt and made me sit over there. Why? I think because I think I was stealing or I was you weren't just have a hat on. No, it wasn't that. I think it was just that I was over there. I want to relate that to real life. What is that called in real life? Racial profiling. Profiling. Mm -hmm. Because they, they, there was no reason to, to stop him, except he was in the wrong area. And, and so is that, is that real? Does that really happen? Um, I want to talk about the police. What does it say on a police car? To protect and to serve. To protect and to serve. And what else? 
biggest letters? Black letters. Police. Police. So who gets protected? Who gets served? And who gets policed? Go ahead. The higher community. So like gold group over there. You gotta talk a little louder. I said like the gold group over there or in you know, some of the middle area. What what happens with them? They just get protected more, so if they see like the lower class over there, they're gonna go maybe question of why they're there. Why okay. Not. So they get policed. I mean, are you are you aware of that? That 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 the authorities treat different communities, different races differently. And so the response is very different. What does it mean to have police in your community? For some people, um, the police represent security and safety. For others, along racial lines, the police are not about security and safety. They represent a threat. Is this making sense to you? Because they are not about protecting and serving you. They are about policing you. And if they are policing you, they see more, even though another community might commit more crime. It's not being policed. And so they're not seeing it. Is this making sense? You know, I like to wear my hair braided, but I know that sometimes that's too ethnic. And, and so when, when I first came and there was graduation, it was like, get your braids out, because you're gonna see meeting parents and stuff, and you can't, you can't do that. Um, I might wear African clothing, and it's like, I have to think, what am I doing this day? Because am I going to do something where people are going to feel threatened and uncomfortable with my African clothing, and I better not present that way? Now, you're looking at me like, this is incredible, but this is real. It's real. This is real. Because people of color represent, we're never just ourselves, we're always our group. And so, you know, if I walk down the hall, and I wear, you know, somebody in my department wears blue jeans and, you know, t-shirt, and it's like, you know, he can get away with it. But if I wear blue jeans and t-shirt, it's like, black people are not professional. What is she doing? She doesn't even look professional. And I can't wear that, I can't do that, because I will not be considered a professional. In, in, and, and so I'm not credited instant respect, and I, I have to always have a consciousness of what I'm doing. And so you have the privilege of not having to have that consciousness. Is this making sense to you? And I, I realized that by myself I couldn't influence very many people, so then I was like, okay, I gotta get other people to stop listening to. <laughs> and then everyone won't be like being treated this way or, or whatever. So what, what, do you, what was mad with how people were being treated? Um, I just saw people lose their autonomy a little bit and just get complacent and really passive and, and meek and, and, and I didn't like that. And so I was, I was trying to be like, hey, you don't have to listen to them, especially if it's more than one of you in a group of you, because, I mean, they aren't going to get so violent you, and physically who are you trying to talk or anything, to? especially in this. Um, well, since the area I was in was in the hall and everyone else moved into the hall, I was talking to them, okay. and then I made an escape for a little bit and came in here, and then I was going to try to talk to <laughs> So, so here's, here's somebody with, with a voice who's seen something, and he's trying to recruit some other people to, to, to see it with him. How does that, who, who, who did that, what happened in real life? Who was that? Leadership doesn't have to come from that box, from the lower class. Where can leadership come from? It can come from anywhere. It doesn't have to be the powerful, most powerful group. There are, there are, it helps, yeah, it helps. You know, if, if, if she had, um, she said she didn't, who was it, um, Camille? Said she didn't like it. And if she, if she had used her voice and her power, you know, John F. Kennedy um, was, was, is credited with, with trying to change things, especially during the Civil Rights Movement. And his brother. And his brother, Bobby. Robert Kennedy. Um, so they, they definitely came from that community. Um, Martin Luther King would have come from the middle class. They can come from the middle class, as did Gandhi. You know, leadership can come from anywhere. 
But leadership has to do ex exactly that. It has to lead. It has to persuade people to see what's going on. You know, he was trying out there. Um, and, and, and he could have started a revolution from out there. But it, it wasn't limited to that. The 100 points that we had, and you were like, you know, we should give it to the other group. We should donate it. I was like, yeah, we need to donate it to them. And I was just really concerned to see what was happening with your guys' group, because then you left, and I was like, that's my group. Like, <laughs> they're all out there. And see, but that's, that's a reality, is when um, people of color are even class, if you move up, then you have a connection to that other group. And what does it feel like to change your class when the rest of you people have not? Or if you move into a privileged position as a person of color, but then the rest of your people don't have that same privilege. There's, there's a real dynamic of now who am I? And how do I stay connected to them? Do I? And that's a reality at Bethel. Because when students of color come here, there's strong pressure to, um, what's the word I'm looking for? Uh, assimilate. Assimilate and be like all the white people here. And if I don't, if I keep my connection to my community of color, then I'm not assimilated and people don't accept me. Is this making sense? And so the students who assimilate and let go of their connections to their communities of color, then they, they, have, they, they do just fine at Bethel because they're, they're, they've assimilated and everybody treats them like they are one of us. But the people who don't assimilate, um, it's much, much harder for them at Bethel. I want to be careful here. Charity is very important in society. But if Ross had spent his entire life being charitable, most likely nobody's really going to change. It's not going to bring what economists call development. Um, so it's nice to be charitable, right? presents for families who can't afford Christmas presents. This is a nice thing, but, but actually they may stay there the rest of their life. And, and meanwhile, maybe Ross has decided to try to shed some of his assets. Oh, I, I, don't, I don't want these, I gotta help somebody else. I would, I would say use your assets to bring more people into the included group, if you will. Don't try to shed them all. Oh, I don't have a degree anymore. I'm just going to be poor. I don't know who that's going to help. Use your power that you have well. I really want to apologize and ask for forgiveness if you were hurt. Um, your feelings are real. Please come and see me. Um, do not sit on it. I did this exercise with somebody when they were 15, and then they came to Bethel. And, and they were in that box, and he said, he said, until the second year that I had you as a professor at Bethel, he said, I was still mad at you for what you did to me in that game. And he said, okay, now I forgive you. you know, and it, it was seven years later, um, and because he held on to it. So don't hold on to it. Um, so if, 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 if something comes up for you, please come and see us, okay? This is, this is about your learning. This is not about uh, us trying to make you feel bad. The helpers that I had, whenever I do that particular simulation, I have to have an experienced helper be the um, oppressor, and because that's the hard role to play. In the other roles, the the person that's facilitating the middle class, they are basically neutral, and that's easy to do. The person who the persons who are servants to the rich, that's fairly an easy thing to do, as long as they follow the instructions. And two of them had experience and two, the middle class um, helper and the person, one of the servants had no experience, that was their first time doing it. So, um, so, but that didn't matter. Both of my oppressors were experienced at doing that part and so that helped that, that experience um, because what happens in, in that particular box, um, they need to know how to respond when students respond. Uh, so that um, helped it work well. The, uh, the students, when I go and make a suggestion about how to respond to the um, lower class, I go to the upper class and I suggested to them, the students over in that box are really slowing us down and, 
and, and slowing up the game. And if you guys would like, um, we can, we can, I can have the helpers move them out into the hall. So you guys think about it. And then the second time I go back, um, they were, they were like, yes, move them out into the hall. A lot of times there, there's a lot of debate, but they, they very much, they were like, yes, let's kick them out. And what's going to happen to their chips? I didn't even have to suggest, what do you want me to do with their resources? They're like, what are you going to do with their chips? I'm like, what do you want me to do? And so, so greed was already at work. And, and so they fell into, um, that role. And so when I had that, and only one of them, I think, wanted to protest and she didn't say anything and so I always wait and make and make sure that I have the majority and five of them spoke up right away and said move them out kick them out and and so that worked for that because that's the piece where when when I process I talk about um, the power using those who are not empowered um, to take away their land, to move them into a ghetto, to put them in concentration camps. So there's lots of parallels in society. And by them doing that, then I can, I can bring in that aspect. And they made it really easy. So that worked well. When we put the juice boxes in the middle, uh, which we did fairly early on, um, it worked really well because they're not given any kind of instruction. And generally what they do is, is they just grab. And that's exactly what they did. And then later on, they're given donut holes. And again, they're not given enough. Um, there's nine of them, and they're given seven donut holes and nothing that makes it easy to divide. And so they just grabbed. And if there's some left over, like there were, um, there's no discussion about how we should divide this up or what we should do, which is typical of the middle class. It's just this big amalgamous class. And, and so that, that creates something for us to talk about. Um, about the lack of decision making, the sense of do they feel a sense of community and, and, and how does that relate to real life. Um, one of the young men took a juice box and threw it into the other group and he didn't have permission to do that from anybody in his group. He just, he just, he just took it and did it and, and so that gives, that gives a lot to, to process. The middle could see, they, they're in the position where they can see, which is like real life. They can see what's happening because they're closer to what's happening on the bottom and they can also see what's happening on the top. And so it's this position of being able to see and that's another factor that, that we can bring into the processing. So that worked really well. There wasn't enough time to process everything. There never is. Um, we, we spent all the rest of the class period processing and then we even had more time the next day to process. We allowed 40 minutes and there was still, there's so much rich stuff there. There was still much more that could be said that doesn't get said because we run out of time. Um, the, sometimes I have students reflect and have a written, they have to do a written reflection. We didn't with this class. Um, but when they write then they bring in more elements that, that can be processed. Um, so there's just never enough time to process it all. Um, so that's about the only thing that, you know, it still worked. If we're talking specifically simulations, um, I, would, I would say my, my process is, is a lot like my designing any kind of a lesson process. I start with what are the key concepts and getting clarity on what, what, what key concepts I'm trying to get across. And then I look at the goals or the outcomes that I'm, I'm trying to have, uh, that I want. And I write them down. And I think cognitively, you know, as a result of going through this lesson, what do I want students to know? What do I want students to feel affectively? Um, what do I want students to do behaviorally? Um, who do I want students to be? How am I trying to shape them existentially? So I come up with those kinds of goals and outcomes. And then then I, I say, okay, um, if I have real clarity on the concepts and I'm going to do something experiential or if I'm going to design a simulation, then what exactly am I simulating? And I get real clarity there. And then I say, okay, how can I set up this um, activity to be as isomorphic to the real thing? How, how can I make it parallel the real thing as much as possible? Because the situation is contrived in a simulation, but if we're going for real feelings, then you have to make it as close to the real thing um, as you can. And, and so that's what I try to do. 
think about the safety factors, you know, um, physical safety. You have to think about um, emotional safety. Um, you know, is this going to ask people to, to move too much into a risk zone? Um, so you have to think about all of that when you go into designing it um, and set it up. And then you have to get all the materials that you need. It's like have everything there so that you don't end up saying, oh, I need something. And then you can't do it because you didn't, you forgot something. But it's like, you know, make a list of, of everything that you're going to need and, and then have it there. And even, you know, if something breaks or doesn't work, it's like have something extra. Um, so you have your, your fallback. Figure out um, how would you evaluate this um, lesson just like you would have an evaluation for another kind of lesson. You know, somebody that's going to observe you doing the activity or the simulation or whatever. You know, what, um, what means, how are you going to um, evaluate what you did? And, and you have to consider that. Um, and myself, I, I work best with other people and I'm, I'm most creative with others. So I, I usually run my ideas by somebody or, or do it in conjunction with somebody. Not always, but, but a lot of times. So it's like, think about how, how do you best design and, and do what's, what's most comfortable for you. Well, I have a master's in experiential ed. <laughs> so I've been very successful. Um, I design simulations, uh, my own, and I take other people's simulations and redesign them and tweak them to make them my own. And I've been very successful um, in designing activities or demonstrations or um, simulations that last anywhere from two minutes to two days and been very successful. In, in all of that, creating um, a simulation that started in Africa, you know, from building an African village and, and went through um, the capture of slaves to the Middle Passage to um, being in slavery to the Underground Railroad to, um, to um, the Freedom Rides and, and the Civil Rights Movement, you know, and the whole, the whole thing took two days. Um, and to something that's, that's very short and, and just demonstrates something, but it's very active and participatory and lasted, you know. It's, so um, I've been successful there. Most, I would say mostly I'm successful. A particular um, student that comes to mind is Ryan. Uh, a few years back, Ryan was really upset at the simulation. Um, he was in the lower class group and, and when um, we were finished with the simulation and, and pulled the students in to start to process, um, Ryan's, one of Ryan's first comments was, you know, you just made that up. And everybody just acted, you know, we didn't act, I was not myself, I would never act that way in real life. And, and it was just, you know, we just did what you thought, what you wanted us to do. And, and so I, I, you know, I refuted him and, and, and so we argued about that some and, and talked about it. But Ryan insisted, even in his paper that he wrote, that he was not, he wouldn't have acted that way. And, and so about four years later, I got an email from Ryan saying, I see what you were trying to do. And now that I'm in the real world and working um, in a church, um, doing ministry, it, it totally changed things. And then Ryan came back to Bethel about two years later and he came over to he started the sim and he came over to me and said, Do you still do that simulation? I said, Yeah. He said, I would love to help you and, and to learn how to do that and how you did that. And so Ryan became one of my helpers and for the next two, three years when he was at Sim, um, whenever I needed a helper, I got Ryan because he wanted to learn and it had been transformative because he couldn't forget. Um, another student that comes to mind uh, who was also in the lower class one of the young ladies, she was so upset about how she was being treated. And she grabbed the door and, and I'm like, where are you going? Um, and she's like, I'm going to go tell the president on you. And in fact, I'm going to tell Jay Barnes because my, my dad knows Jay Barnes and we're going to tell him on you and you're going to get fired. And she was so upset and she ran out the door and I had to send one of my helpers after her to stop her from running to Jay Barnes' office to tell on me and, and bring her back and calm her down. And, and not, she could not, 
you know, she had to just observe. She couldn't watch the rest. But um, when we started to process, she started to get it. It started to click. And, and she, you know, she wrote one of the best reflection papers. And she kept referring back to it the rest of the semester. And when she wrote her um, theology paper at the end of the semester, um, it referred back to lessons that she'd learned from the simulation and the other simulations that he did in class. And, and it was transformative for her. Um, and the third one that, that comes to mind is um, an African-American student. He was in a program, a summer program that I, I do in the city, Urban Leadership Academy. And we did this same simulation, and he was in the lower class. And at the end of the simulation, we always apologize and tell students, you know, if, if you were hurt in any way, you know, please accept our apology. Our intent is to educate, not to hurt you. Um, but he thought that I was particularly mean to him and that, that and he was not going to forgive me. Even though um, he said yes, he didn't really forgive me. He came to Bethel um, five years later. And so he's 20 and he comes to Bethel and he's in my um, um, theology course and then he's in my reconciliation course. And he came to me after the reconciliation course and I had him be a helper because he had done it before. And he said, he said, I forgive you. And I'm like, for what? And he's like, he said, you know, when, you know, six years ago when I said that I forgive you, he said, I didn't really forgive you. I held it against you. And I didn't like you, sort of, for that. But he said, I held it against you. He said, but I forgive you now. And he said, I really do believe that, you know, I understand what you're trying to do. And, and I said, and you held that for that long? He's like, I never forgot that exercise. And, and I just thought you were way too mean to me. <laughs> and, and, and I'm just like, yeah, it's, it has incredible impact, um, or can have incredible impact on students. And they forget our words, but they don't forget what they do. One time, some nuns were the, the, the community that it was being done in, and that's the only time it didn't work. Um, because they're all about community, and it, they, just, they just weren't having the three a three-tiered society, but otherwise it always, I sometimes I think it won't, but it, it always does. One time when I was early on, some, some people got um, argumentative with me as a facilitator and, and I kind of argued back without thinking about it and what my role was. So I got more into my role and started arguing back and, and it kind of didn't work in processing. Um, and so having, um, it didn't work because my inexperience in, in playing a role and being able to discern when I need to be in the role and when I need to be out of the role. And, and so um, I didn't sense my, their opposition and that I was being oppositional. So I set up the situation to be oppositional and that does not work for, for teaching. And so then it kind of didn't work. The first thing I would say is learn how to facilitate. Become the strongest facilitator of discussions. Learn how to ask open-ended questions and when to, um, when to dig and, and probe. Observe other people doing experiential learning activities and exercises or simulations. If you want to um, do a particular simulation and someone else is doing it, observe them doing it and observe you know from all angles so that you really understand the activity so that you can you're, you're comfortable and you know it inside and out because no matter what happens something new is going to happen and something unexpected and something surprising is going to happen and so the more you know the activity then the more prepared you are for it so observe um, then I would say um, be open to the unexpected. Uh, somebody's going to, because it's experiential, part of what experiential education is, is means that you as, as the teacher are not in control of everything. It's experiential. And so, and you can't control, and that's, that's part of the beauty of it. Um, but so you have to learn to be comfortable with the unexpected. And, and so when that unexpected thing happens, that you can go with it. You can go with the flow. You don't have to 
it's not the same way every time and you can be okay with that um, and then you can process you know this unexpected thing that happened and, and make meaning out of that too and be open to what students get from it so when you process you process what happened not just what you want it to happen so you have an idea in your mind of what you want to happen and what lessons um, students can learn but there's other lessons that they learn and there's other other things that happen so process those and get the lessons from that also some of my, my greatest lessons that I have now came from students from something that that students brought up that I'm like I never even thought about that um, example I did a I do a a simulation in um, teaching uh, um, male and female and biblical perspectives. So I did a simulation where I split the class in two, and and I held a, a hung crate paper to divide the class. And I had the designated men, whoever the first half, the first every other person was designated a man. They went into the front part of the class, and all the designated women sat in the back. And so I came in dressed as rabbi, and, and we played it out as if this were the inner court and the outer court, and I talked to the inner court. And in processing the whole thing, um, one of the designated women brought up, um, now I understand why Paul said some of the things he said, um, because we women out there, we stopped paying attention to you. We just started visiting amongst each other, and I would imagine that the women in the first century they weren't, they weren't used to being in the inner court and not learning that way. And so, you know, they, they, you know, all of a sudden you flip it and you say, now you can be in there. They didn't know how to be in there. And so when Paul talks about order and disorder, it's like, oh, the whole thing makes sense. And I never thought about that aspect when I was designing the simulation. But I was like, oh, yes, exactly. And so now I have something new that I can, that I can bring up the next time I do that simulation. Get feedback as you design it and get feedback um, from somebody who, who observes you doing it and get feedback on yourself as, as facilitator, as teacher, and, and be open to that.